Good afternoon. Welcome to the lecture uh, for section 1.5 on continuity for Calculus 1. We already spoke about continuity in the first lecture that we talked about. And remember that we called it, um, or that we spoke about it, in that if you're looking at a function on graph paper, that we could say a function is continuous if you can draw its graph without lifting your pencil off the paper. So you, you can just draw one single continuous line. So this is a very intuitive concept. And if um, the other analogy I believe that I gave was that if you thought of the graph as a road, so the line that um, identifies your graph or your function on, on your graph, um, if you thought of that as a road and you could drive along it, and there weren't any holes or the road didn't disappear and suddenly reappear in another spot. Um, that's another way of kind of conceptualizing continuity. Um, of course in math we have definitions for everything because math is about precision and being very specific and making sure that we're all kind of uh, following the same rules so to speak so that when we use the same terms or the same language we're talking about the same thing. So in terms of continuity uh, we say a function f is continuous at a number a, and that's the x value. A function f is continuous at a number a if the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals f of a. And so all this is saying, sometimes these definitions I know can be a little bit confusing. All it's saying is that um, in order to find the limit as x is getting near a, we simply plug in that value into the formula. So for example, if we were trying to find the limit as x goes to 2 of f of x, what we're saying is that should equal f of 2, and if it does, then the function is continuous at that specific value. <clears throat> Notice that this definition implies, um, um, it requires three conditions to be met. All three have to be met for a function to be continuous. First of all, that um, f of a is defined, and we're talking about the limit as x goes to a. So this means that there has to be a value there. Um, remember that we had graphs with holes in them um, at that value of a, so it wouldn't be defined. We also had um, rational equations where like, we might have x minus a in the denominator. And if we plugged in a into the denominator, a minus a would be 0, and that wouldn't be allowed, so that wouldn't be defined. The second thing is, uh, the second condition is that this limit has to exist. So um, the value has to exist in the function, the limit as x goes to a has to exist, and then finally the third um, criteria or condition is that the limit equals, excuse me, down here, the limit as x goes to a of f of x equals f of a. And this is just saying that the limit is exactly the value of the function. The limit is exactly the value of the function. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at this from a pictorial standpoint. This might help you a little bit better. It is really important for the homework and tests that you um, know these three conditions for continuity. So if you're asked about um, like it, in this problem, it says at which numbers is f discontinuous, and, and then it asks why. It's asking for you to explain in terms of one of these three things. If it's continu discontinuous, maybe it's because f of a is undefined. It might be discontinuous because the limit doesn't exist, or it might be discontinuous because the limit doesn't equal um, the functional value. So let's look at this. All right. Oh, I already missed one, too. I just noticed this as well. Um, <laughs> so notice that x equals 3 right here. Since the one-sided limits, as we approach 3 from the positive direction, um, f of x, is uh, the limit is equal somewhere up here in y. As we approach from the negative direction, y is a negative value here. So since there's a jump here, no limit exists, and therefore it fails um, condition two. It's very easy to see that this is con discontinuous, but again, the key thing here is for you to understand why, and those whys are one of these three reasons. Okay. If we continue on, notice that we when we hit five, the limit exists, and f of a is defined. f of five is right there, that dot. So we have condition one is met. Um, the limit does exist because 
as we come, as we approach five from the negative direction and approach five from the positive direction, they do meet at this hole. So condition two is okay, but notice the limit as x goes to five here does not equal f of five, which is up here. So the limit value as x goes to five would be right here, this y value, but f of five would be this y value. So um, this fails for condition three because the limit doesn't equal the functional value, okay? And notice for um, x equals one, which I seem to have missed when I was preparing these slides, we have a hole here, and this is failing condition one. So we have an example of condition one, which is a hole, condition two, which is a jump, and condition three is a hole where there's a different uh, value defined. All right, so these are some different types of uh, discontinuity. Um, the first one, we can see a little hole here at x equals two, and this is called a removable discontinuity, because what we could do is we could make this a multiple definition, and so obviously when x equals two, then the denominator becomes zero and it's undefined. So we could make this um, have multiple definitions, that's what these brackets here mean, and just put um, f of two equals, and again, whatever this would equal if this didn't go to zero. Um, so that's why it's removable, because we could put a second definition here and say if, if x equals 2, then f of x equals whatever it is, and fill in that hole. Here we say we have infinite discontinuity because we have asymptotes. So as we're getting closer, excuse me, closer and closer to zero, the function's going either to positive infinity or negative infinity. Here we have another example of a removable um, um, discontinuity. Again, we have a hole, and although the value is, is defined for f of 2, it doesn't fill in the hole. So we'd have to either change this or something, but we could remove the discontinuity by giving a definition that would um, fill in the hole. And then the last is when we go from one value to another, um, leaping across. It's not continuous, but it's a jump, and that's what this is at, literally called a jump discontinuity. Um, I think we saw one in that last problem as well. So we've got a whole lot of um, definitions and theorems, and this is just saying that um, discontinuity or continuity is also, um, what am I trying to say? Um, we can look at it um, as partial continuity. So it's continuous from the right or continuous from the left. Again, using these directions, it's continuous from the right, from the positive direction. Um, it might be continuous from the left as well. So notice, um, if I'm paging back a little here, that, um, for example, here at three, um, three is discontinuous from the, or is continuous from the right. It's also continuous from the left. However, um, it's not, these are different values. That's why you wouldn't have um, full continuity. Oops, okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. We say a function is continuous on an interval if it is continuous at every number in the interval. Um, we can also, if we're talking about endpoints, we also look at um, the values that they're coming from. So if our endpoint is um, at the far right of our function, then we say it's continuous from the left. Um, and this is just saying that there's a value, uh, it, that it's continuous on an interval if it's continuous throughout. So if there's a hole in there or a jump in there, then it's not continuous in that interval. Okay. Now this is kind of interesting. Um, so this starts out with saying that f and g are continuous at a, and that c represents a constant or just a number, um, so that the following um, functions are also continuous. So if we have two continuous functions, their sum is continuous, their difference is continuous, their product is continuous, their quotient is continuous, and a constant times either of them is also continuous. And of course, whenever we have the quotient rules, we have um, the caveat that the denominator cannot equal zero. Theorem five is just saying that a polynomial is continuous everywhere, so it's continuous over all values of x. And then b is saying that rational functions are continuous 
everywhere where they're defined. Um, and this is just remember they're undefined when the denominator equals zero. Okay. This is also just listing more functions that are continuous in their domains. Um, polynomials, rationals, roots, trig, etc. So within their domain, within their domain, they are continuous. Polynomials are continuous for all numbers. Rationals are continuous everywhere except where the denominator equals zero. Root functions, even root functions, are continuous except for negative numbers, so zero and positive, and trig functions are continuous everywhere. All right. So this is asking us, uh, let's look at some problems here and how you might see them on the homework and also on the test. Um, on what intervals is each function continuous? So let's first look at A. What kind of function is A? Well, A is a polynomial, and we just said that polynomials are, are continuous over all values of x. We can put any value of x in here, plug it in, and we're going to have some kind of curve or continuous function. So A is continuous over everything on all from negative infinity to infinity. And remember, this is interval notation. Parentheses and brackets are used for interval notation. This is not an xy point. It's a, it's a value of x from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. Next we have a rational function in B. And remember the one thing that's not allowed is the denominator cannot equal 0. Well here if we factor this we get x minus 1 and x plus 1. Right? x squared minus 1 is the difference of two squares. So x plus 1 and x minus 1 cannot equal 0. So those are the two values where it's not continuous. So notice what we'd have is that the continuity um, is between negative infinity to negative 1, then from negative 1 to 1, and then from 1 to 0. Because when I factor the denominator, I get x plus 1, or x equals negative 1, or x minus 1, and x equals positive 1. I'm not factoring those out. You should be able to find domains in your um, algebra background. And the last one we have, um, c is um, some function h of x. And notice that it's we can rewrite each of these conceptually as um, subfunctions, if you will. So if we set f of x equals the square root of x, um, this middle term equals g of x, and the last term equals h of x, then we can calculate the limits. Um, we can calculate each piece. Notice this first piece is a radical. And remember that we cannot have, um, we can't take the square root of a negative number. So this first part is continuous between 0 and infinity, right? x has to be 0 or greater, and that's all that's saying. Um, the second one, we have a um, rational function with x minus 1 in the denominator. And remember, so we set that equal to 0 and solve, and that's x equals 1. So this is g of x part is um, continuous everywhere except that x equals 1. And then h of x, again, we have another um, excuse me, rational expression. But notice the denominator will never equal um, a negative number, so we're, or, or 0, excuse me. Um, if we try to solve this for 0, we get x squared equals negative 1. And no number squared is going to equal negative 1. So h is also continuous everywhere. So notice that what we have here is kind of the overlap between these multiple um, continue, continuities. And so we're trying to figure out this, um, where is the function h of x, lower h of x, continuous completely. And so it's really the intersection of these pieces. So we can see it has to be greater than 0, but it also has to exclude 1. So it would be from bracket 0, comma 1, um, parenthesis, um, and then another parenthesis, 1, comma, infinity. All right. <clears throat> this is talking about composite functions, and it's just saying that if uh, a function is continuous at b, and another function, when you look at the limit for that function as x goes to a, also equals b, then the limit as x goes to a of the composite function equals the functional value at b. Okay, So in words, let me actually say this a little bit better. Your book says it much cleaner than I could. So I'm going to read it exactly as they say. <clears throat> 
This theorem is often expressed informally by saying a continuous function of a continuous function is a continuous function. A continuous function of a continuous function is a continuous function. All right. Let's see what else we got going on here. <clears throat> uh, if G is continuous at A and F is continuous at A, then the composite function F of G given by F of G of X equals F of G of X is continuous at A. Actually, that is the theorem that's related to the composite function. A continuous function of a continuous function is a continuous function. Okay. Um, if we go back to theorem seven, I'm sorry I got ahead of myself. I'm drinking coffee here, but it doesn't seem to be kicking in this morning. Intuitively, theorem seven is reasonable because if x is close to a, then g of x is close to b. And since f is continuous at b, and if g of x is close to b, then f of g of x is also close to f of b. You can look at a, a proof for theorem seven in the appendix if you were interested in that. Uh, I can't see us using too much of that in our problem sets. All right. So here's another theorem that has quite a messy um, definition, if you will, but it's really a relatively simple concept. So I'm going to read it and then try to explain it to you. Suppose that f is continuous on the closed interval a, b. Okay. Again, remember this is interval notation. It's closed because notice it's using brackets, which is saying that a and b are indeed points on the graph. They're not holes or endpoints that aren't included. So this means that they're included. And let n be any number between f of a and f of b. So these are y values, the y value when x is a the y value when x is b, I'm sorry, over here, x is b, and n is some number in between that represent, between these two y values, okay? Then there exists a number c, and it also says that f of a cannot equal f of b. Sorry, that's important, that the y value for a is not equal to the y value for b, okay? Then there exists a number c in such c in a, b, so all this is, oops, sorry. So it's just saying that there's a number C, a value X equals C between A and B, such that F of C equals N, okay? And all this is saying is that if I have a function that goes between A and B, and, and these aren't equal, and there's another value between them, that at some time it's gonna hit that. Uh, so for example, let's say you were um, driving to Austin and you know you, you start out at zero and you're a fast driver so most of the way you were driving 100 miles an hour and but maybe you stop some etc and so when you calculated your average miles per hour um, you hit uh, let's say it was 75 well this is just saying that sometime sometime between when you started driving to Austin and when you got there your odometer was reading 75 that if it, you know you started at zero, your high value was um, 100 miles per hour. That sometime between those two values, you had to hit 70 miles per hour, and that's all this is saying. That there's a value between these two y values if this indeed is a continuous function. Now the difference between the graphs here and here is that there can you can hit that. Um, middle value, that intermediate value, that middle value more than once. Again, let's use the example of driving to Austin. You know, you, you leave your house starting at zero miles per hour and you quickly get on the highway and you're up to 100, but then you stop at Bucky's. Okay, well, you're back down to zero and then after Bucky's, you're back up to 100. So this graph would be going up and down and so your average intermediate value, you would hit several times. And so that's also possible. All right. Let's look at an application problem that may not be quite as intuitive as the example I gave you about Austin um, for intermediate um, values, okay? Show that there is a root of the equation, 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2 equals 0. Now, a root of an equation is kind of the idea that we'd have like x plus 4 or x minus 2. You might think of a root as... Um, 
the x-intercepts, okay? And this is basically just saying that there's a root um, between 1 and 2, okay? So these are the x values, right? That there's a root of the equation between 1 and 2. So let's figure out what the y values are um, when we plug in 1 and we plug in 2. So let's first assume that this is f of x. When we plug in 1 into this equation, what we get is that f of x, 4 times 1 cubed is 4, minus 6 is negative 2, plus 3 is 1, minus 2 is negative 1. So f of 1 equals negative 1. Now let's plug in 2, okay? So when we plug in 2, we get 4 times 2 cubed. 2 cubed is 8 times 4 is 32. Minus 2 squared is 4 times 6 is 24. 32 minus 24 is 8. Plus um, 3 times 2 is 6. 8 and 6 is 14. Minus 2 is 12. So this is positive 12 when we plug in 2. So remember, here we have a negative value, here we have a positive value, f of 1 is negative 1, f of 2 is positive 12, and remember, to go um, between negative number and 12, positive 12, we're going to have to cross the x-axis, which is where um, that value, that root, is going to equal 0, right, the x-intercept. And how do we know that? Because this is a polynomial, and polynomials are continuous. So if I have a value below the axis, and I have a value, excuse me, the x-axis that's negative, and I have a value above it that's positive, of course my line has to cross 0. So we know there has to be at least one root between um, 1 and 2. And here's kind of more of the explanation from your book around this kind of concept. But remember, it's just saying that uh, if a function is continuous, if you're doing something in, in uh, a continuous manner, that if those values are um, not the same where you start and where you end, that of course that there's a value in the middle that's between them two. So again, it's very intuitive and it's not exactly as difficult as the theorem makes it sound.